Are we ready to go? It's 1230? Ready to rock and roll. Okay. This next clinic I'm going to present for you is called Selecting Industries for Your Model Railroad. And uh, because of a guy by the name of Doug Hardy, who lives out in Iowa, uh, and I'm going to have a chance to introduce Doug to, uh, to Fred in, in a couple of weeks at the uh, South Bend uh, Convention. And uh, Doug did a clinic on the Decker meatpacking plant and all the cars that would come to Decker meatpacking, coming in cars, going out cars. And it really inspired me to begin building a series of clinics on industry and uh, railroad operations and things like that. And I'm hoping that uh, that we can hook up with you guys. And he does clinics for us in Michigan from Iowa. We do it by Zoom. And he does a great job. And we probably had six clinics from him over the years. He's my roommate in South Bend at the convention. So I'm sure to be able to hook uh, Fred up with him and uh, maybe he can do some clinics for you guys over Zoom here about the deck meat pecking plant and railroad operations and refrigerator cars and all this 50s stuff. But he inspired me on this thing and I started this clinic and I put it together and it's grown and grown where it's too long. So I split it off and I think I have six or seven different industry clinics now. We'll look at one of them this afternoon called mm -hmm. Tank Car Industries, which was a spinoff of this, this clinic here because it just got to be too long and uh, to look at it. I, it's also I got a point where there's a lot of questions and you could write down all these things. Or if you want to email me, I will send you a handout, uh, just one page. It lists all the questions that I'm going to utilize in this uh, clinic to ask you the things to think about. So I get opportunity for you to, to get some other information. So, uh, so when I put this together and I spend a lot of time driving in cars or travel, whatever, I've always got a pad of paper making notes about things. Oh, here's another idea for something that could be a clinic or other ideas I can use. So I, I started this industry concept and I'm looking at uh, modeling ideas, but industry and all, uh, look at railroad operations and activity, use a variety of railroad cars. Again, our goal is to use as many railroad cars as we can. So I have a new clinic that I'm doing called, what are five busy places that you could model on your railroad that would in include as many railroad cars as possible? An interchange. Is there any kind of railroad car that doesn't get to go to an interchange, you know, and stuff like that. So it's thinking about that kind of thing, because what's our goal? operating trains, moving cars, having a lot of fun. So again, that looks at, it's important to look at how many different railroad cars can we use. And then the right era, right part of the country, and uh, prototypically correct if that's important to you. And some people, it's not important. So here's the little hobby shop. And so I ask you, you know, if you're going to go to buy industries or cars or whatever, you're going to go into a hobby shop, what makes you pick that industry for your layout? Do you have a plan? Is it lay are the businesses uh, industries are on sale? I don't know if you've ever been to this is the Walters hobby shop in Milwaukee. And someday you need to make the trip to Milwaukee and visit Walters and then go down the street and take a tour of Kambach headquarters and see all the layouts that were in the Model World magazine and stuff like that. Two things that are together, they're not very far apart. And then you go to Hiawatha Hobbies, hobby shop too, if you want, west of Milwaukee. But this is Walters. I mean, uh, this is uh, yeah, Walters. So again, I ask you. Uh, you got a spot in your layout. You want to put an industry there. How do you select the industry? Is it based on it was the cheapest one for sale that I saw? It had as part of a bigger plan. I'm building a layout in my basement. It's the, it used to be a, from the Midwest to the state of Washington moved perishables in the 50s. Now I'm just focusing on a switching layout of a fake city called Empire, Washington. And we're going to load up refrigerator cars in the 50s and move them east. But I want to do produce. It's in cans. Del, Del Monte canned goods. So I got to have a tin can plant across town and we're going to bring the cans over to the Del Monte plant and use them. So it's an in-town switching move kind mm -hmm. of thing like that. But I got to do all the research and everything like that to do that. But a lot of people say, well, I just, I bought this edge because it was on sale or I like the color of it, you know, or mm -hmm. use gondolas. I need an industry that I could serve with gondolas or whatever. So think about those kinds of things. So here's the starting point of the questions. The first question I always ask, what era are you modeling? Does that make a difference related to railroad cars? Yeah. Do industries look different in different times and different things? This is a plant. Um, down, have any of you ever been to the West Bottoms of Kansas City where the meatpacking industry was and stuff like that? They're beautiful industries to model down there with signage on them. I love that signage stuff. I want to learn how to do that. But uh, again, just great, great industries from the early 1900s into the 50s in the West Bottoms area of Kansas City. So, you know, so I look at this and I ask the question, what era is it being modeled? What era do you think that is? 1700s? 
<laughs> Late 1800s, early 1900s. Again, uh, we see narrow gauge, we see Colorado, you know, that kind of stuff. So again, you could kind of get an idea of an era. Uh, what era is this? Could be, but you know, when I look at, what are the things that, that tip me off here? Uh, refrigerator car, icing operations, but that's not 50s era kind of building. So it's kind of a mismatch of things. I don't care if you do it, it's on your layout. I'm not gonna tell anybody, but anyhow, this was just, you know, does the era, does it tell us message here or send the message here to you? when you look at that kind of thing. Um, how about this one? This is a layout that's gone now. It was in uh, Iowa and they had to, it was part of a hobby shop and they had to take it down because the state wanted the property for an entrance and exit ramp on the highway interchange. But it was one, it's one of my favorite layouts in the world because of this downtown area. It reminds me of Grand Rapids, Michigan and some of these areas with these old brick buildings, the brick streets and things like that. And so again, it sends a message to me about an era, a year. And uh, that it's being used as well as the, the vehicles, maybe right or wrong, whatever. But I love that the brick streets, the brick buildings, and that's what I want my layout to be look like uh, at some point. So last time I toured a layout, it had lots of those kind of buildings on it. Great stuff. So what era is this? Okay, more modern. That's a good answer because you could, some people, you know, I hang around with those Detroit people. They all have a, uh, an old car in their garage, you know. We call them car people. And uh, during the summer, they drive old cars. During the winter, they model road. But they would look and they'd say, well, what year is that car there? But we see modern auto racks and appliance, things like that. So we get an age there to where what year that's being modeled. And uh, you go from there. This is ADM in Cedar Rapids, um, Iowa. It's the mecca of the... Uh, of ethanol production in the, in the US or North America. Again, tank cars, DOT 111s, the plant, all these things send a message about to er the era that's being modeled there, or if you want to bring that to your layout. What year are you modeling? <laughs> so, what if I want to model this, this engine in those colors? Is there an era? Yeah, BNSF changed black and green on their engines there a, a, a few years ago. And again, I spent, uh, a bunch of months working for Ed, Ch I mean, Ed Chapman, and my job in Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma was to train emergency responders in fire stations four nights of the week, all right? Teach two hours of hazmat, tank cars, all that kind of stuff. During the daytime, I had to get paid to sit along the transcon and watch 100 trains go by during the day and photograph. It was a tough job. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, the wonderful weather, you know, every day out there in the southern New, Me in New Mexico. But, you know, it was all BNSF, and I had a hard hat and credentials to be along the tracks and shoot pictures and stuff like that. But, and, yeah, if you were going to model that engine in those colors, there's an era, a period of time that we correct. And if, it, if you said, well, this is the 60s, and I like this BNSF engine, it's not correct. Maybe it's okay for your layout, but it's not correct. And so, again, we look at that. The next thing is we ask the question, what part of the U.S. are you modeling? Does the U.S. look the same across the country? If you've driven and travel, it does not look the same. So when we start looking at different layouts, can we pick out where it is, you know, and what part of the country are you modeling? This is a friend of mine, Bill Hyden. This is before he scenic his layout up in Door, Michigan. And again, you see mountains and big bridges and things like that there. Uh, and as this fills his whole basement. But I asked the question to you. Uh, as he gets it finished, what part of the country is he modeling? Oh, yeah. so For the West. The, the Cascade Mountains, Washington, Western Montana, Idaho. Yeah, he's modeling the Milwaukee Road uh, with the, the electric uh, cabling and all that kind of stuff. But again, it sends a message, what era is it in? What part of the country is it in? It doesn't look at all like a Florida layout. You know, and stuff like that. Yeah. So, uh, again, as you travel around, think about those things in, the, in your layout that you're building. So, so nice stuff. What about this one? Big granite mountain. So, in Grand Rapids is the layout. Skip likes uh, layout. But, again, when you look at that big rock, where would you find granite like that in the U.S.? If that's where you're modeling. Here about mountain. Could be, yeah. And he's actually modeling Washington with a lumbering river uh, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So again, just think about Bruce Chubb's layout in Grand Rapids or actually Kentwood. Big, tall pine trees. What's that say? 
Northwest. Northwest, yeah, he uh, does Oregon up to, uh, to Washington and stuff like that. So he's modeling that. So again, the trees tell me about a part of the country uh, and stuff like that. This is a layout that got torn down and it's, been re it's being rebuilt now over in Jenison, Michigan. My brother used to be the president of this club. It was called the Superior Northern uh, Railroad. It's in the UP of Michigan, moving iron ore and uh, lumber. And so again, there's a message as to what part of the country is this in as you're modeling mm -hmm. and stuff like that. What part of the country is this? Florida or California? California, mm -hmm. Southern California. This is the uh, San Diego with their, uh, the Railroad Museum there and stuff like that. So when I see palm trees, that tells me a part of the country, the Spanish architecture here on the station and various kind of things, it, it sends a message about a part of the country. So if you're modeling that part of the country, that's what it needs to look like. Uh, this is Southern California also, but it could be different parts of the country as to how we how we farm in the uh, what the farm scenery looks like. And they've done a wonderful job on that layout there with it. This is a part of that same layout, which is really ugly mountain stuff. But if you ever drive across from New Mexico to San Diego across Southern California, it is really weird rocks and all this kind of stuff. It's a it's like you're driving across the moon. Well, they've recreated that on their layout. Another scene, Southern California, again, the hills. Um, there is a layout I visited a few times up by Richmond, California, where we have, we have a grandson and, and kids there, uh, California, where they actually have it all modeled with it all burned off. You know, it shows fire damage and stuff like that, because that's a California scene. And uh, we don't see that like they do that out there. So this is a California, again, looking thing. This is out um, by Kingman, Arizona. And uh, when you drive through there, I mean, that's the scenery for the Kingman, Arizona thing. I was actually out to Kingman to visit with the fire department on the Kingman disaster, uh, LP gas tank explosion, where they responded uh, from the fire station. They didn't know they weren't coming home that day. And it was up on a hill. They could see the burning propane DOT-112 car down there. And the guy, they were hooking it up to disc, to uh, unload it. And the guy couldn't get it to, to tighten up. So he was using a hammer that was already leaking. There was the spark. Fire department didn't have enough water using small hoses, and unfortunately, the tank car blew up uh, and stuff like that in Kingman. So it's a famous disaster as far as that situation. But that's kind of what the scenery out there looks like. So, all right, some more questions. Do you have an industry of interest? How many of you are coal mining? Any coal mining? Okay, that's an industry of interest. So you now say. There's a certain kind of thing or things that you need to have for that layout or a lumber layout, or I'm going to do fish from Alaska or Washington back east, you know, in the 50s, we're going to move salmon. So what part of the country, what kind of industries are you interested in things? Like that? Do you have a one of specific, I already told you, mine is moving apples and pears from Washington to the Midwest. That's my industry of interest, perishables. And in the 50s, so I, that gets me into a certain kind of freight refrigerator cars, gets me into icing, pre-icing, top icing, in-route icing, all those kind of things in that industry. Certain building construction interests and stuff like that. You have, you like support buildings or storage tanks. Uh, last night, we looked at a couple of tanks that were the old up and down tanks with natural gas. You know, I said, what era was that in? What part of the country was that in? The only one I've actually seen for real was coming into St. Louis on the southwest side. There was one of those tanks. It's sitting there for a long time. Now it's gone. Uh, do you want to build complicated industries? Lots of building, lots of parts, things like this. This is the old uh, Los Angeles Model Railroad Club. that has been torn down now. It was about 20 minutes from the LAX airport, right? Just down the street. But they have this refine had this refinery. Uh, they're building a new place or a new building now. But they had this refinery on the layout that they built. And, uh, you, and here's another picture of it uh, and stuff like that. But they used the original blueprints from the refinery to get this to be correct and to get the detail and all that stuff for the era that they had. And they did a wonderful job. So again, Rich looks at this, sees all the pipey tanks. And again, he looks at the railroad cars and says DOT 111, what time period, what year, you know, or DOT 103, what time period were they modeling? What car tank cars do they have there uh, for their layout? And it becomes important. But again, the concept of using the blueprints from the original plant was, uh, was a pretty neat deal. So, uh, mm -hmm. You have a specific railroad car you want to move, you know, and uh, and you would say, based on listening to me already today, what do you think of my favorite railroad car on my layout would be? 
<laughs> refrigerator cars, not tank cars. Although I have lots of tank cars in both old and new because I have a, a 33 car tank, a car train derailment that I use for training responders and a lot of other displays of tank cars. But <laughs> it's refrigerator cars is the interest that I have. And I, I crazily, I bought one the other week at the Kalamazoo train show. I don't know why. He was just a great salesman. And I thought, oh, what the heck, I'll buy it, you know. And stuff like that but you know so if you're looking at specific industries or specific kinds of cars that you want to have on your railroad then you know that's a good way to go so here's a picture from cedar rapids iowa uh, adm again so we have the Crandick railroad engines and we have lots of tank cars modern dot 111 tank cars in this picture so again if that's the kind of industry you want then those are the kind of cars you need to have but intermixed within these uh corn syrup cars there's also acid cars and other kinds of cars that come into this for the different products that they make besides corn syrup and ethanol. So again, um, we'll talk more about this in, uh, in, the, in the tank car clinic, but again, everything that we make mm -hmm. comes from these three things, solids, liquids, and gases. And so when you're evaluating an industry that you wanna build, ask the question, what do they make and how do they make it? Look it up on the internet, solids, liquids, and gases, all right? And do we need to add other things to the original mix to get our final products. And of course, we always ask the question, how do these things get delivered? And on your layout, they get delivered in what? Railroad cars, because we aren't modeling trucks. You know, we're not in the truck hobby, we're in the train hobby. So how do we get them all there in the railroad cars? And um, so I have another clinic that I do where we use a T-chart and we put the name of the industry up here. We put the product that the primary product they're gonna make, other products they can make from the same materials there. And then on this side, we go down and we list all those materials they need and then what kind of railroad cars are delivered it. On the other side, we go, these are the final products that come out of the plant and what kind of cars do they come out in? And these are other products they can make and then go on railroad cars. And oh, by the way, we have waste. There's waste products that come out of these plants that we want to get rid of. There's always a market for our waste, scrap metal. Uh, you go up to the steel industry in Chicago area there, Gary, Indiana, they use spent sulfuric acid, spent hydrochloric acid. It's still corrosive, but it, they used it once to clean steel. It's got a new thing. Maybe you've got a cement plant on your on your layout and you're going to have a kiln. What do they use to fire the kiln? Off-spec flammable liquids. You know, I used to do a foam school in Wisconsin. I left a lot of PFAS on the, in Wisconsin when I left to come back to Michigan. But we used to burn 55-gallon drums of liquids. Uh, there was a chemical plant that had off-spec liquids that didn't come out right. And they'd, load, they'd give me 30, 40, 50, 55-gallon drums to dump in the pit to burn all afternoon. They were off-spec. They got rid of them for them. But there may be a market, like the kiln. Let's take it to the kiln. We'll burn it there. As long as it burns, that's the only criteria we need. Maybe it doesn't have to have a specific spec on it to burn in the kiln. So, again, what can I do with the waste products that come out of our thing? So, if I'm going to make fat or uh, make uh, pipe, plastic pipe from peanuts, plastic pellets, what else could I make in my plants with the incoming plastic peanuts? Plastic fences, plastic decks. Plastic furniture, plastic, 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 all with the same product coming in. Do those same things going out, going to the same car as the plastic pipe? No, I got box cars now and uh, things like that. So I end up with different kinds of cars uh, picking up those products. It all started with the same thing, came in covered hoppers, plastic pellets, plastic peanuts. So again, think about that. Think about waste. Again, waste comes in three different kinds. What kind of car is going to be used? If you ever get to Doug Harding's layout or have Doug talk to you, um, one of Doug's things coming out of the Decker meat packing plant were gut guns. All those guts that weren't used at the meat packing plant went in gondolas. So he has those modeled and uh, leaving his plant. The only missing is the smell and the flies, you know, on them and stuff like that. But gut guns, and it was just part of the thing. And also the meat packing plant industry has got a bad reputation for when the snow goes away and the ice melts in the river. We dump all the waste in the river and it goes down to somebody else's town. And common thing. We had a big uh, meatpacking operation in Cedar Rapids that was known for that kind of thing. So anyhow, so think about those things. Again, what support materials might be needed to this industry uh, to make stuff? Again, so again, I do a whole clinic where I had the room up, uh, flip charts around the wall, putting all this stuff together and then presenting back. And they're like, Rich, this is like going to school. Yeah, I got a bachelor's and master's in education. You know, I've been teaching for 50 years. So, but everybody's involved. And I have a newer version of it now that just deals with potatoes. And we, hey, this is a raw potato, and I want this front row here to get up here and on the flip chart, tell me what, how do we make potato chips? 
what do you need to make with tab shifts? And how does that stuff all come in and what kind of card? And then how does it leave? In the next row, it's going to do canned potatoes, all different ones, whole sliced, all these kind of things. The next row is going to do uh, frozen potatoes products, hash browns, french fries, all these kind of things. Uh, and I gave one last weekend in Rockford too. Okay, you're going to make potato salad. Figure out how to make potato salad. What do you need to do to make that? And what does the cars come in? Oh, we got to use mayonnaise. What's it come in the tank car? You know, what does it come? Is it 55 gallon drums in a box car? And so, yeah, look at all these things. It, you do your own advertising, storage equipment you need. When does new equipment come in? Is it coming on a flat car? Uh, and that kind of thing. So a lot to look at. Do we have industries that operate on a waterfront? Why are they on the waterfront? What's the reason for it? So what's the reason here? This is old Wisconsin paper company. What's the reason for the dam up there? To get water for what? Well, making electricity or making water to move stuff, you know, it, it turns things. things like, there's a reason for it. ask those questions. You know, why is it there? Uh, and why was that plant built on the river? This is a paper plant up in Vancouver, Washington, across from the river from Portland. It's on a water source, so they need it for making paper. And again, all the wood that comes in there. But ask those questions. What do they have this for? Why is it there? Uh, this is a uh, loading facility in Portland, Oregon on the river that goes out to the ocean. So they bring in all these covered hoppers, dump it in there, and then they put it in the ships, and then the ships leave. The reason that plant is on the river is what? Transporting that stuff in ships out to the ocean to other countries. So again, this is uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, the Quaker Oats, the world headquarters of Quaker Oats. And again, why is it on the river? Uh, well, I found out on, on uh, Friday, June 8th, 19, or 2008, when we had 20, 31 half feet of water, it's too bad it was on the river because it was now flooded with the water all around the plant. But uh, you know, there was a reason when they built that plant years ago, they wanted it on the river. What were they taking from the river? Uh, matter of fact, Sammy and I were talking this morning and uh, in Cedar Rapids, when you move there, they have a, a slogan. It's the city of five seasons, summer, winter, fall, spring, and your season. But the locals all call it the city of five smells, Quaker Oats, ADM, and um, there's a cereal processing, mm -hmm. and there's another one on the river, but they call it the city of five smells, and uh, based on the community. So this is a, a plant out just north of a, a Portland, Maine, or not Portland, Maine. Um, yeah, Portland, Maine. And uh, it's right on the highway. I drove by it again in May when I was out in Maine, uh, in the can Eastern Canada. And it's a B&M baked bean plant. Okay, there's the sign on it and stuff like that. Wonderful model. All my friends who are B&M railroad people all wanted to copy these pictures because they want that plant on their layout. But the question is, why is the B&M plant on this river? Is that where they get the brown water that goes in the can with the beans? Boss, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, this is where we do computer research, internet research. And we go in and we look at this and we say, b and baked beans. Matter of fact, when I was there this summer or last summer, it was being turned into a college campus and classrooms. But before it was b and baked beans, it was a sardine factory. Oh, now we know why it's on the river and ships came in and all that kind of stuff. And so, again, it's a, a kind of an interesting thing, but you got to do your research. You know, why is it on the river and stuff like that? So. All right, this was a layout in in Iowa also, but again, they did a lot of modeling of the Mississippi River with these and uh, with barges, and you would see the same thing with the Ohio River and some of the stuff that would go up and down. So again, why is it on there? Why is the river water brown? You know, Mississippi. Uh, when when we had our floods up in in Iowa, uh, every it shuts out all the water treatment plants, so everything goes into the river and it just comes down the Cedar River and eventually gets the to the Mississippi River. That's why the Mississippi River is brown, because all that stuff coming down from all those other places. But again, just the concept of what are we doing? This is Bruce Chubb's layout in Kentwood, Michigan. And in the center there, there's an aisle. That's the river in uh, in, in uh, Portland. And so we have UP, or not UP, yeah, UP on one side, Great Northern on one side, and uh, uh, type of thing. So other industries that need water, what are you looking for? Oh, okay. Um, again, power plants, what do they use water for? Cooling? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Chemical industry, they use water that's in uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, river for their processes. The old mills in the old days, meat packing, told you about what do they do with the old stuff at the end of the winter months? Throw it in the river, send it to another town, let it be their problem. Can't do that anymore. Transportation of products on water, again, are all reasons to look at those kinds of uh, uh, industries on the river. So again, another area you could look at is I call them community industries. If you're in a big growing area, agriculture industry, uh, you could say, well, this is the center of our town is the ag co-op. And everything comes into the ag co-op from fuels to fertilizers to clothing to cars, uh, gasoline, all that stuff comes out into the farm co-op. And so the community lives around there. Everything they get comes from there. Uh, the mine industry, if you're in the coal mining, we'll say, uh, is that a community industry where all the people live in the coal mining town and things like that? So, uh, again, all the stuff they get comes in there. So all those different cars are going to come to that facility. Now, this young man back here raised his hand. He's like coal cars, the coal mining and things like that. So if he's going to have a coal mine on his layout in a town and stuff like that, what kind of cars go to that plant and what kind of cars leave to that plant? What's the predominant car? Opera cars. Excellent. Okay. Do you ever on your layout bring in dynamite? Special move? Okay. Do you ever bring in timbers to use in the mines and stuff like that to support the walls and the ceiling, stuff like that? Another that, that would be on a flat car or maybe a box car. So there's another car. Do you have a, do you make all those people from your community walk up to the mine to go to work or go back home? Or do you have them moving up in a passenger car up and a passenger car back down? So constantly passenger cars going back and forth. Rich, we never thought about that. Think out of the box. What else could be done there? And I always like the, the dynamite move. You know, that's every every second or third operating session. We have a special move of dynamite being brought into the mine and uh, how that's done and things like that. So think about that. The steel industry, paper industry, again, all huge industries with lots of moving parts and you want to model. So this is up in Gary, Indiana. Again, mm -hmm. all kinds of things were going on over the years there. And I can remember going from Holland to Chicago and, oh, we're going to have to drive through Gary again. It stinks, you know, and stuff like that. Different today, but again, it's quite an operation. This was a Coke plant out in uh, out east. So, again, what kind of industry, what kind of cars, what do they do there? Uh, what goes in, what goes out? You know, what do they do with their waste products? If you ever get up in the upper part of, of Minnesota, the, the iron ore range up there, this is what it looks like. This is what your model should look like mm -hmm. on your railroad if you're doing open pit iron. You know, collecting and stuff like that, and then you got to bring it down. This is a model you typically see at Wisconsin at the uh, train fest, but this is where somebody's modeled on a module the mine below the the track. How many of you model below your bench work? You know, here's the mine, and uh, they have all these little people working in there and stuff like that, and then they bring it up to the top. There's an industry just uh, east of Grand Rapids where they pump during the spring. They put LP gas in the ground in the caverns and then in the fall they pump it back out put it in tank cars take it out to use for heating so twice a year there's all these moves incoming 112 tank cars putting propane down in the ground taking propane out of the ground as far as that situation so and they, and they use the salt mines in detroit for other things in other places in michigan where they've removed all the salt so you can model underneath here and have an extra space this is a place west of grand or east of grand rapids <laughs> where they put the propane into the ground. So you have a tank car, set of tank cars, DOT 112s, unloading, loading racks, and again, it all gets pushed down into the ground. So you don't even have to model that part. It's underneath the layout. But again, things so. Complicated industries, just a list of some of the different ones. So again, you know, we're going to talk about tank car industries a little bit for now. But again, what's going on here? What are they doing? What are they making? New product, old products, spent fuels, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Houston, Texas, looking off the uh, bridge. Look at all the different kinds of storage tanks that are in that picture to support the petrochemical industry. So again, this is uh, that kind of an industry. If you're going to build it, how do you have all this? Do you understand what all these different kinds of tanks are and how they work? Uh, the loading, unloading racks in the petrochemical industry in Texas. So again, what kind of tank cars do we see here and what kind of products? Also, a lot of things have what I call support industry. So if you're looking at uh, the automotive industry, okay, so we go over here, Louisville Assembly or the truck plant. They make a product there. We'll call it a vehicle. Do they move it to someplace else or somebody else do that for them? That's another industry is the movement of vehicles. And um, so, again, we'll look at that. Mine industries, they get a lot of support things, farm equipment, power plant. Uh, up north where I lived in Holland, 
there's a power plant, to, actually two of them, they're getting ready to shut it down. But now on the plant property, there's a coal car repair facility because all the coal cars come in from, uh, from mm -hmm. Wyoming. And so they bring them there and that's where they repair them on the power plant property. It's a separate industry, but again, the cars need to be maintained. So again, uh, and rail car support or repair service facility, we have one in Cedar Rapids, Iowa for ADM, covered hoppers and ethanol cars. Uh, they bring it into the, the facility. So, so again, here's the automotive support operation to get all those cars moved to where they need to be. Uh, this is up in uh, Iowa, John Deere factory. So this is where they put them on railroad cars and they would move them out of here. If, if they were on railroad cars, they were going to the ports to be shipped overseas. If they're on trucks, they were going to somewhere in the U.S. So this is what I used to see all the time in Cedar Rapids is flat cars of uh, different kinds of tractors going to to the ports. This is behind the Cedar or the uh, Quaker Oats plant. So uh, there are facilities also that do a fin. Uh, you go from a starting raw material to a finished product. So you can go to, to 2025. You can come up to Detroit area for the convention. And you can go to the Ford Rouge plant and see them make iron ore finished vehicle all on the same property. And that was the Henry Ford concept was to do it all in one place. So steel, paper plants, all these things. Again, the idea of having it all on a, on a product, on a one facility. So here's a paper industry. And again, we got all the sawdust and stuff like that there. You know, one of the things you, you don't credit Henry Ford for is that he had plants up in the UP where he was kind of uh, Michigan. He was cutting down trees because they needed wood on the Model T's and stuff like that for floorboards. And various things. They had all the sawdust. And they figured out something they could do with the sawdust. And uh, they compress it and things like that. What's that called nowadays? Charcoal. 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 Yeah. So, again, a whole other industry from all that sawdust. But you can do particle board things. And if you look at that picture, you'll see covered hoppers. You'll see tank cars, low-pressure, high-pressure tank cars because of all the different chemicals that are used in making paper from sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, chlorine, things like that. These are the clay cars for making paper. So, again, you look at all that. This is another picture of that uh, plant up in Vancouver, uh, Washington. You can see on the far side there where all the incoming wood is, and then it just works its way through the whole plant. At the far end is where we got uh, boxes, corrugated paper or cardboard boxes. And uh, it's a whole process. So understanding how that all works. So it's a complete industry from one end to the other. So here's somebody's model of a paper company. So what do we see in the, in the picture here? I see tank cars. High pressure and low pressure tank cars. That's good. Uh, I see uh, incoming timber. It's going to be made into stuff. I see, uh, you know, box cars, things like that. So a lot of different cars. But ask yourself what comes if you're making paper. And we'll do this in the tank car one coming up. Uh, what is needed to make paper? How does the process work? And you can go into the Internet. Uh, another picture, Bruce Chubb's layout in the middle there is a uh, processing facility for paper. So raw materials at the far end, and then it comes all the way across on there. Yes, this is a layout. Actually, has five levels in his basement. Mm -hmm. so, uh, this is not a good picture. I should take it out. This is, uh, if you ever get to Portland, Oregon, uh, the Portland Model Railroad Club has a beautiful layout downtown. And uh, this has got a paper making industry from the logs coming in on the water to cutting up and shredded and going to the paper industry. So. Uh, again, some people will do modules. So this is a paper making industry. And uh, here's, this is uh, some pictures that I got from another country. But anyhow, I use it to illustrate how do we make paper and cardboard boxes, corrugated paper, as they call it. So you have all these steps. And can I do the research to find out how to do this so I can build a model of it? And uh, this model is actually in England. And I got it off the internet, asked the guy if I could take the pictures and use them in a presentation, no problem. But if he can do the research to figure out how to make paper <laughs> and build a model of it all, we should be able to do it. And this industry is here in our country and stuff like that, but a beautiful industry. And it's modular in shape, so it's taking places. And here's the finished product going out the back door. Uh, this was a cement factory down in Illinois. And again, uh, bringing in all the stuff and taking out things. And uh, I went to a guy's house, a physician in the town, and he had gotten the blueprints for this plant to build it on his layout in his garage and uh, had all the same parts in there and uh, did a beautiful job. The only thing I, I didn't like about this layout was it was out in the garage, didn't have a basement because he was right by a lake, so water problem. But he would burn oil lance, lanterns in oh. the operating room, the railroad room, when people were there visiting. So he had that smell 
you know, of railroad engines and things like that. And I'm a safety guy. And I'm thinking, I wonder how many parts per million is this? Or, you know, how come nobody's wearing respiratory protection? You know, and all these kind of things. But anyhow, that's his deal. So anyhow, they, he again built this based on the blueprints of that cement factory that was in his town and uh, made a couple of changes to fit. But again, just did a really nice job with it. So if you have that opportunity to get the blueprints and you want to build that kind of industry, you know, cool thing to do. All right. What about seasonal industries? You have, uh, you know, I noticed that people are mowing their lawns already down here. It's only the beginning of April, you know. Uh, and I'm another month or so away from getting out the lawnmower. But again, seasonal industries. What can you do that's seasonal on your layout that would have an interest? In my case, again, the perishables are fruit coming from Washington. So at, at one time before I tore the layout down, I moved to Saudi Arabia, then came home and got involved with a different woman I, who I'm with now, and I'm living in Goebbels, Michigan. Um, we had a, a part where we were harvesting apples. And my layout was in September 1959. Apples are ripe to hang on. And if you go to Yankee Candle, you can buy a Macintosh apple candle spray and candles. So I would spray that down and the people would come in the basement. God, you could smell the apples. Yeah, they're ready to go. We got to get them going east. You know, it's seasonal. And so that's the month of modeling, you know, and stuff like that. I also, they have one uh, that's a, a forest that was really nice in my Washington mountains as you came across the, the U.S. So, again, thinking about those sprays. And you have to be really careful about the smells because there are people who are allergic. My wife is allergic to smells, and I could put her into anaphylactic shock uh, just based on using those sprays. So things to be, and you may have other people in your uh, your layout club. So here's apples again. What season are apples? September, October. You know, if you're moving potatoes, what season are potatoes? So find out those times so you can model that period. Uh, do we do trees, uh, pine trees, Christmas trees, whatever? This was a uh, Christmas tree, uh, flat car load by a guy up in uh, Rockford, Illinois. This was a cherry plant up in Traverse City, Michigan. They don't do rail service anymore. But again, uh, you know, what month are, are tart cherries uh, harvested? And then again, the, the movement by railroad. So this is Rochelle, Illinois, big huge um, refrigeration operation there. And again, moving stuff from there. Uh, people have asked me off the time about, well, why don't you talk about the fishing industry? Okay, so I put a slide or two in here that deals with the fishing industry. I was up on a cruise going from Seattle to up into Alaska, and we got off a couple different ports, and I walked around the fishing area to have a look. But, you know, what are they catching? How are they selling it? What are they doing to it? Is it going to be in cans? Is it going to be fresh? All those kind of things all needs to be looked at before you build your layout to put that all in. Is it is it in the icing period or is it where we have a mechanical refrigeration? Is there waste that's got to be removed? You know, everything from a fish ends up something. You know, just every like everything Doug Harding will teach you, everything from a cow or a pig ends up in something, except for the oink or the move. But everything else, you know, and how many different industries can you put on your meatpacking plant property that uses all the different things from bones to fat to whatever for all these different industries? So, uh, so here's an oyster car. You know, that you could model. So there's all these things. How about the brick industry? That's kind of an industry you wanted to model where you're doing things with clays and making bricks and then loading them into boxcars and shipping them off. When I lived in Mexico, Missouri, and I was this plant safety manager for Dawn Foods, Mexico, Missouri is the center of the world for fire brick. All these plants around there made fire brick that was used in the steel industry, the uh, base at the space shuttle or the uh, Cape Kennedy, Cape Canaveral, all that stuff was from Mexico, Missouri. AP Green was the, you know, the center of the world for fire brick. So there's a lot to learn about that and, uh, and there's different kinds of brick plants and stuff like that. So again, something else. Uh, so again, I come to the next thing. We talked about industries. How do you buy railroad cars? Based on price, based on color, based on brand? Or is it based on what do the industries on your layout need for incoming stuff and outgoing stuff? And, you know, a lot of people will say, well, I, just, I bought these at the train show last week and why? Well, the price was right. What are you going to use them on your layout for? I don't know. I just like them. You know? Yeah. And uh, I went through my thousand railroad cars and got rid of 300 of them because the build dates were after the period that I'm building. I've since replaced those with 300 more that were in the building. But, you know, <laughs> but I did get rid of 300 at one time to a guy. I used to see him on the table at the train show. So uh, again, ask the question, 
you know, here's a plant. Why are those kinds of cars at that plant? What does the plant do? Why do they need those kind of tank cars and other things that are on there? Um, this is Doug Harding's. This is his old Decker meatpacking plant on the original layout in northwestern Iowa. He's about three layouts later now, or four layouts later. He's a pastor, so he moves a little bit. But as I said, he got me started on this, and his Decker meatpacking plant was a two to three hour switching operation on his layout, just in one place. A couple of people just working the whole day there, switching out cars. But his, his plant needed refrigerated cars, box cars, stock cars, tank cars, hopper cars, gondolas, and flat cars being at that period. All those cars were used to service that plant. And so what were hopper cars used for? The 50s, how did you make heat? How'd you make steam? How'd you? Coal. Coal, yeah. So, and I told you what he did with gondolas. What were those? Yes. Gut guns, taking out uh, tank cars, taking out the blood that was harvested from the uh, things that were killed. And there's market for blood to go to fertilizer and things like that. Refrigerator cars, obviously, for finished products. Box cars, bringing in boxes and car all these things. So again, it, it's it was a, it was the clinic that got me started going down this road. Uh -huh. but, uh, so here's this little part of his layout, and that's a two to three hour switching operation right there for a couple of people. <laughs> so neat, neat concept, neat plant, and uh, so like this. This is another one in Kansas City again, uh, meat packing and shipping and things like that. So again, think about what would come in, what would go out, what era, what do I need uh, for ingoing outcome. And again, we're all about operations, so. As I told you, I described this on the wall a little bit ago, but this is this T-chart thing, this concept where across the top, we listed what it is, what are the products going to be, and again, everything coming in on this side, and what kind of cars, and everything going out as final products, and waste, what kind of cars. So again, if you sit down and do this with all of your plants, you'll have a better understanding of the operations of that, oper that plant and what's needed and all those kind of things. So, you know, I drive around and I take pictures looking down train tracks at industries and say, okay, What's coming in here? What's going out? What are they making? And then go do the internet research. Uh, if you ever get up towards in uh, towards Minneapolis, St. Paul, Jeff Otto is another good one to have as a clinic pre presenter. But he has a 3,900 square foot basement. He models the iron ore range in Minnesota, two levels. Um, and uh, at the bottom level is Minneapolis to, to Duluth. And then uh, from Duluth up to the iron range up on the upper level. And there's all these mines. So you have to go pick up all those ore cars, bring them down. For a while, you couldn't buy ore cars from Walters because they were all going to Jeff's layout in the hundreds uh, for his uh, layout. So just a couple of things we'll look at here. This is an earlier picture of it. Uh, been up there a couple of different times, but just a, a real understanding of how does the iron ore operation work up there. And of course, he wanted to model the Duluth Harbor with the ships there to do that. But he's going to discover that after he got the house built and the basement built, he was going to have to add an extension to the basement to get the ore docks in the way they were, uh, you know, on the real side, that real size, uh, size. So he didn't do that, but he does have a great thing. You couldn't buy ore docks because Jeff had them all from Walter for a period of time and stuff like that when we were down. These are the earlier pictures. This is what it looks like now. And here's the ore docks coming into Duluth and uh, and the stuff like that in the Duluth area. So Duluth City is on the other side. These are the ore docks coming out from the Iron Range Hibbing and Proctor Yard or also just a, a great layout to go see. Uh, one of those that has no vertical uh, things to hold up the roof or any ceiling, all pre-cast pre concrete and stuff like that. The garage is parked above the layout room, you know, nothing to interfere. So another thing about those ore people is that they will model blending ore. So if you can look close in this picture, you'll see little red and yellow pins in the cars. That's different, different mm -hmm. ore grades, different kinds of ore. And when they bring it to the dock, then they dump those cars down and it mixes in the chute and goes to, to the, quality, the specifications that the uh, person that's going to receive it has. So I think it's they've, they've smoked or they've inhaled too much taconite dust, but they, they use the pins in there to indicate the kinds of ore and then how they mix them together on the dock to get those three cars or four cars, whatever, to dump together to get the proper mixture. So, again, something maybe you haven't thought about. And you can do the same thing with your coal. What size coal particles? Is it kitchen coal? Is it industry coal? All those things are different sizes of coal. And I have slides from some places out in Pennsylvania where you go up to the coal dealer and they have the different sizes of coal on the side of the building and the chutes that come down. So what are you using your coal for? And that type of thing. So again, here's they are going out to the loose docks and then they uh, 
like I said, they'll take them out there. And in the old days, now it's all taconite, but in the old days, different blends and stuff that the companies ordered and they dump it down the chutes into the ships. So again, think about your regional products, regional scenery, uh, all that kind of stuff. What kind of things are going to happen in this part of the world? You know, uh, lumber, again, we're going to, this is the old iron ore uh, yard. It's now a lumber yard, but again, they cut down the trees and they put them here. And then where do they go? What kind of trees do you have? What kind of loads do you need for that? Maybe you're going to make lumber. Maybe you're making paper. Again, do that research to find out what you need and how is it done in the life of that product. So, and again, you may have some interest, as you mentioned, his coal trains. This may be an exciting picture to him. We're moving coal across the U.S. from Wyoming to wherever. All right. Somebody else is, don't have any interest in that at all. But if you're going to move coal and it's going to power plants or whatever, you need to do that research. And most of our coal nowadays is coming from Wyoming versus the anthracite coal from the East Coast that uh, we used to burn. So again, now ethanol plants are kind of interesting. This is something a lot of people are modeling. So if I bring in corn uh, to dump and uh, make ethanol out of it, that's a wonderful process. I was reading last night at the hotel room about how they're trying to switch from corn to switchgrass. And they'll have these big fields of switchgrass to make ethanol from. That's the future. Uh, you go down to South America, they use sugarcane to make their ethanol. But we bring that corn in, we dump it in here and stuff like that. We produce ethanol. What are the outgoing products from this plant? Pure ethanol. UN 1170, spirits, medicines, other kinds of things. Denatured alcohol, UN 1987, which has what in it? Three to 5% gasoline. It's mixed, so you can't drink it if it dumps over, and then some other stuff. But then what are the, some of the waste products coming out of here that you could model? DDG, dried distillers grains. What's the market for that? Feed, animal feed. And the feed, the cattle and stuff love it. There's alcohol, they got smiles on their face as they're heading into the cat to be cat or be killed, all that kind of stuff. What's another thing that's a side product besides DDGs? Bourbon. Well, that's pure. Love it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What else? Waste, waste stuff. Carbon dioxide. So are you going to take the carbon dioxide and pipe it over to a plant that makes dry ice and other stuff? Or are you going to put it in tank cars and move it off to somebody who's going to use it in carbonation for soft drinks or alcohol or whatever? What's your CO2 market for, you know, and there's some other products that come out of the CO, of the ethanol process that you could use in your modeling, different kinds of cars. And I use that dirty word trucks, you know, to do. But if you don't research the ethanol industry, it's not just incoming corn, outgoing ethanol. There's other products that you can market as waste products off your industry. So, again, doing that research. Uh, and if you're going to model intermodal, what's the world of intermodal operations? I do a whole clinic called Intermodal 101. It looks at start to end, you know, all the different coast to coast. So again, is intermodal a time period defined thing? What part of our of our years is intermodal? Is it 1920 to 1930? No. So we it's got a defined period that that's when your model railroad has to be looking at if you're going to model uh, intermodal. Do you just have industries on your layout that you can't live without? And it's just kind of a list of them. So, like that. so, again, we come back to my modeling perishables in 59, going from Empire, what a clever name of a city for a guy who models the Great Northern Railroad, uh, to, the, to the Midwest or to the East Coast. So I need to have ice houses. I need to have different kinds of things that support my business, my operation, uh, and doing the research. Same with if you're going to do a coal mine or agriculture, all these different things. What are must-have? kinds of things to go along with. So some other things that we can look at real quickly here. We're going to be done on this one at what time? Uh, one 10 time. minutes? Okay. We'll just go with these until we run out of time. So again, do you have buildings with loading docks? Do they have doors or no doors? I mean, these are just things that you look at in industries that uh, might, you know, have some ideas for you. No doors. Here's a loading dock. Again, away from the, uh, the building. So again, modeling of it. So just think about that. Do you have any industries you want to divide by train tracks, by mainline? I think this is kind of a cool scene. You go through, this is over in Iowa. A couple different railroads come through, right through the middle of an ADM plant. Just cool. I mean, this was uh, Vancouver, British, or Vancouver, Washington, the mainline BNSF going right through that paper plant, right through the middle of it. Uh, this is in Kentucky. This is a petrochemical or an automotive gasoline plant. 
again, the train tracks, you know, they built one side and then, oh, we need more space. So we'll go on the other side, train tracks built. So main line going right through the middle. Of the so here's a model of that kind of thing. Just really cool stuff. Neat scenes to model. So here's another one of the train tracks going through the plant. Again, the walk away across the track. So communities of interest, again, uh, if you get out there and visit, these are some great places to get ideas. This is the bottom, West Bottoms area of Kansas City. And uh, the, the train tracks come through. Lots of neat old buildings there. Uh, there's a hobby shop just down there to the, the left in the picture where that green docks caboose hobby that uh, we were talking about last night. Is it still open or not? If you didn't park close to the building, the back end of your car would get taken off by the train. But there's just a lot of neat industry buildings down there with lettering on them and uh, different ages. There's a John Deere tractor plow kind of company. So just cool stuff from the 30s, 40s, 50s, maybe before. Uh, and then you can translate that to an industry, a community on an industry, that period of time. Uh, so Chuck Hitchcock's railroad, you can't see it's gone now. He's building a new one. But again, industries on the wall. So um, is there other industries in town that support the big industry that you need to have or have some impact on, on the industry? This is a little welding shop in Duran, Michigan. Okay, what other industries did this shop support that I would need to have the model of this on my layout for? You know, to think about other kinds of buildings, other kinds of industries that you have. Um, this is a long plant versus short plants. So again, the, these plants back in the 20s, 30s, 40s were massive size. So this is up in Owasso, Michigan, where the 1225 steam locomotive is. It goes right by air. This is a casket company. What raw materials would you need to have to come in to build caskets? Wood, fabric, yeah. Metal, metal. yeah, metals, things like that. So again, here's an old factory that's making caskets. So you could build that on your layout. Think about what comes in there by railroad car and what's needed. So furniture companies. So a lot of different things. I, I got a new clinic I'm doing next month in, um, in Sturgis, Michigan. I'm just kind of putting together about modeling the back side or the track side of industries. You know, if you go to a Walther's kit and you look at the front picture on it, what does it show? The front of the building. Do we care what the front looks like? We want to see the railroad side of the building. So I'm working on this clinic that looks at, looks at what does the railroad side of the building look like in the old days versus today. And I've shoot a lot of pictures. I've been sharing them with a friend of mine in Australia, Brad Hinton. And, oh, that's cool. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, okay. Nowadays, the, the, this is not a rail serve industry, but the trains pass it. So that's a scene that you need to have in your layout. So take a look at some of those things as you're going. Uh, is there a standard look for agricultural buildings? No. They come in all different shapes and kinds. Here's a, an ag facility that's uh, got tank cars at it. That's kind of strange. What the heck is the deal with that? And over on this side there, well, it's a soybean factory. So we bring in soybeans and covered hoppers. We make uh, soybean oil, so it's going to go out in tank cars. So don't make all your flag factories, you know, think in terms of why well, you need to have a soybean plant here and uh, that type of stuff versus corn and some of the other things. So they don't all look the same based on the time period and where you're modeling. Minnesota, Minneapolis. So again, big and small, all different shapes and size. And think about that from a modeling standpoint. How do we do it? How do we model? So, this was a guy in Iowa who made displays, modular displays. He loved modeling the winter scenes. And so, so this was his whole thing. It was a you know a four by eight sheet or whatever size of plywood. And he built a model on it in a backdrop. And it'd, do, it'd be in the winter because he liked the snow scenes. And the, that was his model rarity. Or this was another one of his. So, so again, think about that. Think about the track work, you know, and uh, some of these switching areas, not the best, you know, go different directions. It's maybe not the same level. Who would put a diamond right in that spot there? You know, the tracks <laughs> to cross. The real railroad, you know, well, I guess you could do it on your layout and stuff with that already. So, again, just, you know, track work could be a variety of different things as you look at the things here as we get to the end of this. So again, yards, this is that same place in Portland, Oregon that feeds the ships. And so again, the tracks loop around across the river, but they also come in on a curve to the backside of the plant on where their ag products. So, so a curve, the industries on curves is real. We talked about the uh, circle routes for ethanol plants. 
So again, you have a loop uh, on your layout that uh, we bring the train in and it goes all the way around for uh, loading or unloading, whichever way you want to do it. So again, do you have any track work in the street? Kind of an interesting thing. So again, we'll just quickly, you know, how do we unload and unload covered areas, open areas? There's a lot of different kinds of ways to do this. There's a shelf layout. So just things to think about. The only thing I tell you about um, covered and uncovered facilities is sometimes you can get it so congested that you can't see the car numbers and they're difficult to reach and all that stuff in operations uh, here. Okay, go pick up the two uh, GN uh, boxcars in here and here's their numbers. I can't even tell if it's a GN car in there, you know, and stuff like that. So, again, things to think about. So, again, um, I'll we'll bring it to an end. There's lots of different industries that you can model, you know, different kinds, different sizes. Do your research, look at the time period and ask the questions. What do I want to model? What do I want to make? All those kind of things. And what time period, what part of the country and uh, and go from there. So this is just a big industry. This is a guy who had a huge railroad north of Rockford, but he didn't do operations. He just liked to build industries for his layout and other people's layouts and stuff like that. The wall was covered with UP and BNSF engines. Never did operations. He recently passed away, but just an incredible layout. So, so questions. We'll take the last couple of minutes here for questions. We'll give you a chance to hit the bathroom before we start go to the next layout or other things are on your schedule here for next layout, next presentation. Yes. How much time span should you try to model? How much time during your week? <laughs> no, I mean, you pick a date. Oh. If you're going to go for like pick a date. Which place you go? Well, it, well, it, it's kind of a go back a certain point in time because you can add things in. But if you're going to go forward, you don't know if BNSF is going to change your paint schemes on the railroads. Warren Buffett may go, I really like blue, you know, and everything comes off that color. So trying to go forward is difficult because you don't know what changes are going to be happening or what railroads are going to merge. You know, so recently we had Kansas City and, uh, you know, and stuff go with other railroads. So that, again, we're looking at new paint designs and, and logos and stuff like that. But um, I, I just kind of pick a year. Like I picked 1959. Why? Because I like icing as part of my operation. I'm modeling what? Perishables. And you don't move perishables till they ripen and we harvest them. So now I'm looking at September, October. And I worked as a grocery store produce manager for a while. And I used to look at the bags. Where are they coming from? And so like right now you're buying fresh potatoes, you know, that were picked this fall. But this summer there'll be a lot of sales on potatoes because we got to get rid of all the ones that are in storage. And uh, so as a cashier, I used to be able to go touch, look and smell. I'm sorry, there's bad potato in here. We need to change this bag out, you know, and stuff like that. Because we're, we're selling potatoes that have been in storage since last fall, you know, when they were harvested and stuff like that. So again, I picked September, October, 1959. So my perishables are ripe. They're ready to be shipped to the East Coast. I need 1959. We're still icing cars. And again, we load the car, we uh, pre-ice the car and get it cool. We load the product and then we top ice it in some form or fashion on the ends or inside the, uh, the thing. And then in route, we got to pre-ice it again every so many days to keep it cold to where it's going. And the interesting thing about perishables is when I load them into my refrigerator car to sell, they may not have a market. A lot of perishables were shipped from California, Washington, other place, Oregon, without a destination. They were shipped on the train and they had three or four days before they got to Chicago, maybe. And during that time, I'm still trying to sell this car load of perishables. So it may come off in a certain place and go someplace it wasn't even planned on when it was put in the train because somebody finally sold that load of oranges or that load of apples and uh, now it has a new destination. So again, some of the things that occurred back in the 50s with parachutes. And that's part of doing that research and talking to people, meeting people and stuff like that. So, so I can't get, like, give you a specific answer, but just look kind of, what are the other factors that come with picking that situation? I mean, who would have thought today that Kansas City and, and a Canadian railroad would be one organization <laughs> and stuff like that. We're getting down where they're gonna all merge before long. Uh, we'll just have one or two railroads at East, uh, East Railroad and a West Railroad, and then some guy that goes from I mean, Canada and Mexico in the middle. Stuff like that. So, other questions, thoughts?
again, I hope I gave you some ideas here. And again, if, if you want the handout that lists all those questions, I'd be happy to email. It's just a one page thing. You can get a card with an email address and email me and, uh, and say, Richard, I want the list of questions and I'll send that to you. But, because uh, everybody in the old days were always writing them all down. And then we got to where people were taking pictures of the slides, you know, which is okay. I don't care. And yeah, stuff like that. But it's uh, both ways. But yeah, it's just trying to give you some things to think about uh, as to why. So I'm Mali 1959. What industries am I going to have? What things are connected to my industry? And uh, again, as I said, I want to put perishables that are moving fresh. And I want to put perishables moving in cans in boxes that are going to uh, warehouses for AP and Kroger and all these different chains so i got to take cans well where do we get those from we're gonna make them across town ship them over here so now i got cars with with uh, metal going to the tin can factory cardboard boxes to put them all in and move them over so things to buy. okay what's next on our schedule the meeting is at two o'clock and then at 2 30 we'll hell on with tank car industries tank car industry so this is just a break we're on a break we're on break now okay